Uh, so yeah, my name is Christine Urscha again, and yeah, I've been with Soul for a few years now. And this program that we're speaking about today is one that myself and Sandora and others uh, created in 2021. And today's presentation is really just going to go over the the purpose of the program, what we're trying to achieve, and also give you some highlights and examples of green and green spaces that were recognized last year and how you can generate your own ideas or um, find ones in your communities that um, also resonate and meet the criteria. So, so as I mentioned, the program was launched in 2021 and it's national. It's a national program that recognizes urban green spaces across Canada that exemplify greener stewardship. And the, the word greener and greener green spaces, uh, what we mean by that is stewardship that centers ecological community health and well-being and intentionally goes about caring for the land to increase the diversity and resilience of the landscape. The, the aim of the program really is to recognize regenerative and ecological land care in urban settings across the country with the ultimate goal really, and with Seoul's mission um, as an organization is to inspire the widespread use of ecologically focused practices that support urban bio biodiversity and resilience. Uh, so the basic criteria of the program, we came up with these sort of general areas and we'll be talking in, in more detail later about how that has been applied, but in, in, in terms right now to understand the program um, and to qualify, a site must be publicly accessible. So it doesn't have to necessarily be a public space, but one that is accessible to the public to visit. And that's important um, to understand right off the bat. But really the, the crux of this program and, and what we're trying to focus on here are the acknowledgement and the recognition for sites that are cared for by different groups. Uh, in ways that increase the biodiversity and support plant health, that's a key one. Also the ones that improve soil health, and protect air and water quality, and take steps to minimize waste and energy consumption while in the process of caring for the land. And one that is fundamental for, for soil is the active avoidance of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, given that there are so many alternatives that have a much healthier um, and positive outcome in their use. So in, in 2021, when we launched the program, we were very excited that 26 sites from eight provinces across the co country qualified and were recognized. And there's a map on, on the right-hand side here. You'll also find it on Seoul's website. And it's a map of Canada and you can see uh, the circles are where the sites are. So all the way from PEI, on the right hand side, but all the way along westward to, to British Columbia. And if you look on it um, in more detail on the website, you'll see that they uh, belong to sort of different types and different categories of green spaces that we'll get into. Um, so yeah, what are those types of, of green spaces that, that qualified? And one of them um, that received quite a lot of or submissions was related to pollinator and habitat gardens. And the ones I'm just giving you a few samples here. So there's a, a general idea of, of what these sites are. Uh, on the left is the, the Gosling Pollinator Garden. It's in Guelph. It's at a hospice. And so it's a, it's a green space that is focused on not only creating healthy habitat um, lands for, for wildlife species, but also one that is fostering health for humans. And it's a, it's a well-known, well-recognized um, garden in Guelph that tours sometimes come to. The master gardeners um, always tour there. They have a lot of community partnerships to keep it going. On the right-hand side, the leaf demonstration garden. So that's an NGO in Toronto. And the way that they have operated in the last few years is to create these demonstration gardens. And these are all at subway stations in, in different parts of the city in a very urban, very dense part of the city. And the purpose is really to not only demonstrate the possibilities of creating habitats and pollinator gardens using native plants, but really it is to show that this is possible no matter what the space is in terms of size and the urban properties around it. So, Following that, there are more examples. And in Ottawa, there's a park that is part of an initiative by a community group 
to depave an area, a street. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's a partnership between city officials, and in this case, federal officials, because it's federal land. And so once they depaved, they actually took over different parts of this, this park area and its extension into federal lands to build not only pollinator gardens, but a tiny forest. They removed a lot of invasive species that were there and they just keep adding layers to this and over time are progressing into larger footprints of showing what's possible with regenerative and sustainable land care. On the right here is a garden in Regina. It's a peace garden. It's um, in front of and beside uh, a United Church. And it's again on a very, very busy street in Regina. So this is a refuge. It's a refuge for people. It's a refuge for the pollinators and the other species that get to visit this place. Um, a lot of people come uh, and and are engaged with this, not only when people are actively working on it, but are also invited to share that space and to really benefit from that atmosphere of this beautiful garden. Uh, another category of green spaces um, in the applications that came in last year are municipal parks. And that was quite exciting. And it shows too that there is this uh, development and progression of different type, types and styles of parks and parkettes in municipal areas, small and large, that are reinforcing the same ideas and principles that we have, which are, it is about the biodiversity, it is about creating habitat and spaces where uh, native plants that have been pushed out and uh, that need to be there to support um, the wildlife and, and the human um, appreciation. So in this case, there's Edlington Park in Toronto. So it's not the entire park, but it's a subsection. And it is uh, in an area around a community center, so very human centered. And the, the gardens that are planted, it was a private firm that, that created this. So in partnership with the municipal government, and they basically have a food forest, they have medicinal plants and gardens, they have plants that are specific um, to pollinators. So it's a beautiful space, it's complex, it's diverse, it's going to expand over time as well as things grow up and layer with the different trees and shrubs and plants and grasses that coexist there. On the right hand side is another example of a private firm um, committing to this notion and working and getting a contract through municipal government. And this one's in New Brunswick and it was built on a very so manufactured landscape. So you can see towards the right of that photo, there's a lot of concrete. It's, it's a seawall that's very straight and narrow, but what they were tasked to do is help with flood mitigation and also help with um, having some habitat for, for when the flooding's happening, but also for the species that are missing out on, on habitat across the, the coast. So this is a, a particular park that's uh, newly created but over time and the plan and the engagement with the community is all about teaching learning and progressing into something that's you know going to be more mature and going to be uh, a real highlight for the community to have this this space that was before prior very cold and sterile um, another type of greener green spaces are those that are in urban areas uh, that are ecological restoration projects, ones that are trying to bring back uh, grasslands. For example, in this case in Brandon, Manitoba, this is an NGO, it's a property uh, that is, I think partly the city owned and the NGO owned, well, if we say owned, but in this case, it's, uh, it's a project and restoration education site to engage people about the, the native grasses that are um, and were very, predominant in Brandon in that area, but now have been reduced. And so this is bringing back and introducing, reintroducing and removing invasive species to bring back the, the grassland. And in Surrey, BC, this was another municipal led project. So this was staff um, in the, the parks department that created this beautiful, very large um, pollinator and sort of meadow property. And what's really nice about that is they have a lot of interpretive signs. This is giving the people in that area the chance to learn about these species that aren't commonly on 
you know, public managed municipal properties. So this is just a, an example of what is now being more appreciated and more upcoming in terms of the way that municipalities are going about what they're doing. They recognize we are in a crisis for biodiversity loss. We're in a, in a time of a climate crisis where there is more flooding, there's more drought. Um, we don't need to have more maintenance of, of lands that need a lot of mowing or um, care. When you have grasslands like this, this is actually helping to reduce the maintenance costs and provide all of those um, beneficial um, plants and habitats for, for wildlife. So I think the fourth category are food forests and community gardens. So we got quite a few submissions for this category. And um, one of them, so is in Ottawa, close to where we are, and it's an NGO. It's on a property that has multiple farm agricultural enterprises. And so this particular one is is a demonstration forest, an, an edible forest. And they're also really engaging the public on the value and the importance of, of trees and their various um, contributions that they make. And on, on the right side in Hamilton, another greener green space was on the property of, a, of an NGO that is multifaceted, a very holistic and interesting NGO called Green Ventures. So Eco House, um, this property, they, they did many things for in terms of land care. And one of them was creating these community gardens that are, are features for community well-being and sharing, learning, and also are cared for in a way that is very um, considerate and intentional about the, the plant and soil health and how these spaces and the types of plants can be beneficial for, for humans and other species. More community gardens. So this one on the left is a permaculture farm garden in Naramata, BC. And we had a presentation, a webinar um, related to this garden or many of these actually. And it's, it's fascinating too. There's so many different ways that the community has been involved in this. And again, this is a year after year and, and all of these spaces are when it is this, this type of green space, we know that there's um, evolution and progression and, and furthering the, the plant diversity and the maturity of the, the trees in particular that are on that site. So it's a very, I think beloved, it seems like a very beloved community space. And in Kingston, this is a, another big garden. I think it's, it has many, many people who are actively involved in allotment um, garden, gardening on that site. And again, it's focusing on plants that are, are good to attract and, and keep pollinators around, but also uh, for food security. And that idea of growing food in a local setting and being, doing it in a community, in a community manner. Finally, there, there's um, a few sites that are green or green space recognized um, in 2021. And one of them is on Wolf Island. And it was a project that had been in the works, so interesting in terms of how the community came about to establish this in the most thoughtful way in terms of the planning, in terms of the consideration for where the materials came from and, and the trees and how the community would be involved. So this is a, a space that I know that we're going to want to follow along in the years to come just because they have been so intentional about the, the, the way they plan this and it relates to this model of tiny forests um, in other parts of the world that have been seen to create biodiversity rather quickly with a, a planting of trees that are in close um, proximity to one another. So I think what we learned from this program over the first year and what was so interesting about it is that there was a lot of diversity in terms of the space, in terms of the, the size and, and the scope and the history of these. We, we did have some submissions that had been in, in place for a long time and this is how they've been doing this or they've sort of shifted to, to have sites that were more cared for in that regenerative fashion. Other sites were fairly new and they were just excited. They were on board already with the sort of principles and the ideas behind this and they were interested to share that. So at this point, um, the way that we have set up this program and we continue to run it is that it is open to the variety of 
types of urban green spaces and those that are meeting the under one one acre to those that are much larger um, spaces in urban areas. So I don't know how much time I have, but I'll just go quickly to sort of say that um, one thing that we learned and might be worth sharing for people who are thinking about applying and wondering how do, how do we do these things? Um, so being the criteria of increasing biodiversity, I just thought I'd bring out some of the ways that um, the explanation was of how people did that. So of course, one of the most important things is the planting and of, of native plants and trees for the, the right local context. Um, plantings, if it is intentional, mainly for pollinators, it's having plants that are at bloom at different times. Also, what we find increasingly in urban spaces, as most people know, is that there's a need also to, to be removing invasive species. That's what's coming in. So a lot of times these, the way that um, groups have gone about increasing biodiversity is also by first removing invasive species and then planting. Another criteria was um, sort of consideration and attention to the soil and plant health. That's of course critical as all soul members know and others. Um, and so adding nutrients to the soil that was um, sort of standard mulching, the use of cover crops. Of course, one of our criteria was avoiding or actively trying to avoid the use of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and the focus on microorganisms. And all of that to say that it's, it's not only that they're doing it, but they're doing it with the, the idea of increasing the learning about that, increasing, increasing the knowledge of the importance of that particular area and, and sharing that community-wide that that's where the focus um, has to be. Uh, another one that we find really important to emphasize is that is while we have these green spaces and while we're trying to work on those particular sites, it's really important to look more holistically at where the materials come from and all the ways that, that we can reduce the environmental footprint while we're doing this type of work. So the ways that we were asking people and groups to explain what they were doing, some of the feedback came or input was the, the cycling of nutrients on site, the composting, um, using existing materials that were there, not always sourcing from other places and, and moving materials. Seed saving has become something that several of the groups talked about. Also local tree nurseries. So in the case of Ottawa, for instance, the, the, where the depaved new site was, uh, it's a large oak savanna area. And so the, the community all in backyards and front yards and in the park were growing oak seeds as part of this project. And also another way of reducing energy and materials was as much as possible looking to the, the community right around the site. And in this case in, in Naramata in BC, um, the, the community garden was using a lot of the brewery, the local brewery residue, and also engaging um, with arborists to get some wood chips. Oops. Another thing that we found that came out more than we expected really was the community collaborations. And in, in these photos, you can see different ways that people were involved. There is a heritage trees arborist who is there. This is in Toronto at um, Windermere United Church. They're dropping off wood chips. There's a group in the middle that are the volunteers who are doing a lot of garbage collection and invasive species removal. Uh, below that, there's a photo with uh, uh, a woman engaging children. And, and that too, that's a community garden in Guelph, very active and with a real idea of immersing the local population in this in the garden communities and how rich that can be for, for everybody's in terms of community connections and in terms of individual and community health. So yeah, we found that there was a variety of ways that partnerships mattered. And in Hamilton, for instance, there was the gardeners came together with a group of naturalists and it was interesting to see how those two groups um, wanted or, or came together to work and, and what they learned from each other by doing so. Obviously municipalities and um, private landscape designers and practitioners, that's very important. That's how some of this work gets done. 
and municipalities and NGOs working together, or governments and NGOs working together. Uh, the one example that I can think of with the community groups and schools, that is the tiny forest on Wolf Island. And they involve the school children, I think at the elementary level, they're gonna be doing a lot of research in terms of understanding as this forest develops and over time, they have some indicators and they're, they're hoping that part of the group that will be helping to monitor the site will be will kids under the guidance of their instructor, their teachers. Now, so for this um, upcoming year, and just to share how this process all works, uh, so those who can apply for a greener green space, and there are probably more that, <laughs> that are possible, but last year it was the, the, those in private sector, so the landscape designers, the land care practitioners, uh, municipal staff were sometimes those who, who put the applications forward, community associations, NGOs, schools, institutions, and faith communities. Now, putting this question out there, because we are hoping and expanding this year. Last year, we were grateful and excited to have 26 that qualified. And this year, we're hoping to at least double that. So we're, we're turning to everybody to, to share information about this uh, new, fairly new program. And we know that there are more sites out there that, that are exciting, interesting, and um, good for that community learning that we're all doing through this program. So the application um, this year, we have two streams. So we have a stream for those who were recognized in 2021. And so that application form is really sort of an update, a status update and talking about sort of what progressed over the last year. And then there's an application that is for the new sites that are coming on board this year. All of that can be found on Seoul's website. And just to say again, this is a Seoul program, I wanna emphasize that this is a way that Seoul is, is engaging its members, it's sharing the knowledge and appreciation for the approach that Seoul um, emphasizes or puts forward. And so another program that sort of combines with this is the, the weekly seminar we have on ecological approaches to land care that's related to the 2022 year of the garden, year, the ecological garden. And so in July and August for the next eight or nine weeks or 10 weeks, we will be featuring the 2021 sites. So that it'll be really good to hear from people who will be sharing and touring around their greener green spaces. And those will be posted um, on our website as well. There's registration and you can sign up on Seoul's website. Now, finally, there are people and there's questions to be asked. So I put out the, the email um, address. So to contact, if there are any questions about this program, you want to get in touch beforehand, um, please feel free to do so.